For organic compounds, the four simple atomic orbitals won't quite get the job done. The reason being that the perpendicular arrangement of the px, py, and pz is not analogous to the geometries that we see in organic molecules, tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and linear. What we need to do is combine these orbitals with one another to create what are called hybrids that have the proper geometry of organic molecules. So we're going to throw out the simple atomic orbitals and look now at combinations of these, so for instance 1s and 3p orbitals, that have the proper geometry. When we need to place four electron pair domains around an atom, we'll need what's called sp3 hybridization. An important point of MO theory is that the number of molecular orbitals out equals the number of atomic orbitals in. This is why we need to use the 2s and all three of the 2p's in order to create four hybrid orbitals for the four bonds associated with this tetrahedral center. These orbitals look essentially like skewed p orbitals. So we can imagine a large lobe pointing up towards whatever the center is bonding to with a small nub of opposite phase on the backside. And I highly encourage you to include that nub even though it's very tempting not to. The other three orbitals would look similar in the sp3 set and would be pointing to the corners of a tetrahedron. Say we only needed three electron pair domains around an atom. In that case, we would use what's called sp2 hybridization, where now, instead of taking all three p orbitals, we only take two of the p orbitals along with the s. That would lead to an orbital set that would look something like this. One thing you should keep in mind is that the energy of the sp2 hybrids is lower than the energy of the sp3 hybrids because of the greater amount of s character in the sp2 versus the sp3 orbital. Finally, the lowest energy hybrids, the sp hybrids, would be needed in cases where we would need two electron pair domains, as in an alkyne. In this case, the hybrid orbitals look like this. Although we most often think about hybrid orbitals as participating in bonds, in many cases, hybrids can also be used to hold electrons. When they just hold a lone pair and don't participate in bonding, we call these non-bonding molecular orbitals. We're going to see instances where we combine the hybrid atomic orbitals with each other to create bonds, and in those cases, the energies of the molecular orbitals will differ from those of the atomic orbitals. So let's look at a hypothetical combination of two molecular orbitals. The molecule of interest is ethane, C2H6, and what you're seeing on the left side of this slide are two sp3 hybrids on the two carbon atoms of ethane approaching one another. If we add the two orbitals together, then we get a combination in which the orange regions reinforce one another in the center. This corresponds to a bonding combination, as you'll see. If we subtract the two, well then, this orbital here goes to purple, and the two phases end up subtracting each other. This leads to destructive overlap in the center and an anti-bonding combination. So here you can see the resulting orbitals. Notice at the top that we have the quintessential node in the anti-bonding orbital that destabilizes it relative to the bonding orbital. And in the sigma bonding orbital here, what we can see is a very nice region of high electron density between the nuclei. Each of these orbitals brings in a single electron, and so when they combine, we end up with two electrons in the stabilized bonding orbital and no electrons in the destabilized antibonding orbital for an overall stabilization of the entire molecule. Similarly, now using ethylene or ethene C2H4 as our molecule of interest, we can imagine two 2p orbitals on the sp2 hybridized carbon atoms combining now not in a head-on fashion, but instead in a side-on fashion where the axes of the orbitals are parallel to create what are called pi-type molecular orbitals. When we add the two orbitals, the two orange phases will reinforce one another, creating a bonding orbital. When we subtract the orbitals, again, this upper phase will go to purple, the lower phase to orange, and will end up with destructive overlap on both sides of this nodal plane in the center here. So we'll end up with an extra node in the anti-bonding orbital not present in the bonding orbital right between the nuclei. You can see what that looks like 
in these diagrams, the pi bonding molecular orbital contains one node, the nodal plane of the original p orbitals, but no nodes between the nuclei along the axis of the bond, whereas the pi antibonding orbital does contain a node there. As before with the sigma bonding case, we have two electrons in the stabilized bonding orbital, no electrons in the destabilized antibonding orbital. Because pi type overlap is more indirect and weaker than sigma type or head on overlap, the energies of the pi and pi star orbitals are not quite as extreme as the energies of the sigma and sigma star. This leads to a broad picture of orbital energies that you see here. The lowest energy or most stable orbitals are sigma bonds, and these rarely participate in chemical reactions. Pi bonds much more commonly react and non-bonding lone pairs as well as electron donors. And the most common electron acceptors are empty atomic orbitals, which belong to carbocations, which are sometimes called A orbitals, and pi star orbitals, which are the pi antibonding combinations that we just saw. It's important to remember that filled and empty orbitals interact with each other to make organic reactions happen. We'll see in the next video that filled empty interactions within a single molecule can provide insight into why one molecule may be able to be represented by multiple resonance structures.